Well, before we come to consider Ezekiel 37 together, it's probably going to be helpful if we press pause and back up a little bit and just remind us of what was going on with God's people at this time in salvation history. In fact, we'll jump back five years before the book of Ezekiel begins, and you'll find the northern kingdom of Israel have gotten themselves into a mess. Just like the tribe of Judah before them, Israel has turned away from following the true worship of Yahweh and have become guilty of religious hypocrisy and idolatry. And for years, God has been patient and gracious with his people, warning them over and over again through the prophets, calling them to turn from their idols and to renew covenant with him. But these warnings have fallen on deaf ears. Just like Judah, Israel is about to be judged with its second exile. And that's exactly what happened in the year 597 BC, just as God had promised them. Israel was attacked and yet more of its people were carried off into Babylon. Uh, Among those who were carried away was the man we've now come to know as the prophet Ezekiel. And the book of Ezekiel begins with him, sat by the river Kabar with his fellow refugees, far away from Israel, serving under a foreign power. It was no doubt here that Psalm 137 was penned, that well-known psalm which says, by the rivers of Babylon we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. That's where Ezekiel is sitting, by the rivers of Babylon. He's now 30 years old and he would have been beginning his ministry as a priest in Israel. Instead, he sat captive and exile in a land which isn't his own. Though the situation looked bleak for Ezekiel, God has not forgotten him. We're told in Ezekiel chapter 1 that the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel. He has this amazing vision of God on his throne. And words fail to describe the splendor of that moment. There are wheels, thrones, rainbows, mystical creatures, rims full of eyes, and one seated on the throne who is shining with the glory of heaven. Ezekiel tries to describe it, but the best sentence he comes up with is that it was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. His words fail him in this moment and he falls on his face as though he was dead when he sees it. So the book of Ezekiel begins with this vision and the Lord raises Ezekiel up and calls him to be a prophet, a messenger of God. He's to speak to the house of Israel, warning them of yet further destruction to come if they will not turn from their idols. And only after the message of judgment has really sunk in deep into their hearts Is Ezekiel going to speak anything of restoring grace? So in the early chapters of Ezekiel, that's what you find him doing. He's warning over and over again the house of Israel. He pulls out all the stops. He even performs street shows to try and warn Israel about what's coming. He builds a little castle of Israel, then he destroys it. He chops his hair off and then he smashes it with a sword. He lies on his side for one year as the scapegoat and then cooks his meals over some animal poo. All in an effort to communicate to the people of God the message of coming judgment. But the people's hearts remain hard, the people remain wicked. And finally, Ezekiel is given a vision of the temple in Ezekiel chapter 8 to show him how bad things have gone. And he sees 70 of the elders of Israel They've turned away from the Lord their God and they're worshipping an idol. The women are outside, they're praying and they're weeping for a false god, Tammuz, one of the Babylonian gods. And perhaps the most disturbing thing Ezekiel has shown is inside the temple itself. The men have turned their back from the, uh, turned their back from the Lord and his altar and they're facing towards the east, worshipping the sun. The fear of God had departed from Israel. And it won't be long now until God's temple presence, till till he himself departs from Israel as well. And in chapter 10, that's exactly what happens. The throne with its wheels, eyes and rims, it takes off and it goes away from Jerusalem. It leaves the temple empty of the presence of God. It is ready to be torn down and smashed by the Babylonians. Babylonians. 
So things were not looking good for Israel at all. But God did not leave them without hope. You see, one thing we learn in the book of Ezekiel is that God's throne has wheels. His presence is transportable. And while it's true that God is going to come out of Jerusalem, he is going down to Babylon to meet with his people. And that's where Ezekiel begins, isn't it? God meets with him in in Babylon because the presence of God has wheels. Though he's forsaken his temple, he has not forsaken his people. This is not the end of the story for God's covenant people. God is going to be faithful to his promises for his own name's sake. And as you reach a bit further on in Ezekiel, from chapters 37, uh, sorry, 34 to 37, God begins to explain to Israel that there is hope. There is a future for Israel. The exile is not a judgment which will last forever. God is going to bring his people back to himself and there will be redemption. Chapter 34 explains that he's going to make a new leader for Israel, a king like David, only better, one that will shepherd Israel in righteousness and not lead them astray. Chapter 36 explains that God's going to give them a new heart. He's going to change them from the inside out in order that they might follow God more consistently. And here in chapter 37, we see fleshed out for us, no pun intended there, How it is that God will bring about this change in his people. So admittedly, I'm I'm skipping over a lot of the doom and gloom of Ezekiel and we're jumping into the section of hope. And it's my hope this morning that as we look at this passage, we might come to understand both what it meant to Ezekiel and his his hearers and how we might apply apply the lessons of this passage to ourselves today. So with that as a rocket speed overview and introduction and to the book of Ezekiel, let's jump into Ezekiel chapter 37 and see what God would say to us there. In verse 1 of our passage, just as we see elsewhere in the book of Ezekiel, the hand of the Lord was upon Ezekiel. God was to show him what he wanted him to see. Verse 1, the hand of the Lord was upon me and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord And set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. Now it doesn't take any special discernment, does it? In order to see that this is a pretty grim image. A grim image that Ezekiel is seeing before him. This is a mass grave. And when you see a grave like that historically, you know that a terrible tragedy has taken place. It's not the kind of place you take your wife out for date night, is it? Let's go look at the bones, at the corpses. It's not somewhere where you'd send your kids to play. I still remember as a child, there was an old slaughterhouse near where I lived. And um, they used to just throw the pig bones out the back of it. And it seemed like a great uh, mountain of pig bones to me when I was an eight-year-old boy. Of course, that's the perfect place an eight-year-old boy would want to play, isn't it? In a pile of pig bones. Mm -hmm. But I still remember the look on my mum's face when she realised that me and my friends had spent the afternoon playing among the pig skeletons, trying to put them back together. She was not happy one bit. (laughs) and I I was banned from going to the slaughterhouse after that. It's not the kind of place she'd like to go. And to a Jewish mind, this image would have been even more grotesque. And for the Israelites, exposed bones, it speaks of uncleanness, Covenant curses and the judgment of God. Numbers 19 reminds us that for the Old Testament church of God, if they so much touched a bone, they were to be a human bone. They were to be declared unclean for seven days. One of the covenant curses you find in Deuteronomy 28 was that the corpses of the children of Israel, if they didn't listen to God, would end up exposed and be as food for the birds of the sky. And here Ezekiel's walking round a pile of bones and the birds have lit the flesh clean. As verse 2 it points out, he led me around them and behold there were very many on the surface of, of the valley and behold they were very dry. All the flesh had gone off them. All dry bones all over the place, are people subjected to the judgment and the curse of God. 
Then the Lord turns to Ezekiel and he asks him a question, verse 3. He said to me, son of man, can these bones live? Now, the most obvious answer to that question is, no, they're not going to live. You know, we don't go around seeing skeletons coming back to life. It's not something you and I are familiar with. But Ezekiel recognizes who it is who's asking him the question. This is the one who sits upon the throne, which Ezekiel cannot even adequately describe. So Ezekiel, humble, humbly, mindful of who he's speaking to, says, Oh Lord God, you know. Now if the account wasn't strange enough for you, as Ezekiel stands in the valley of dry bones, speaking to the living God, not in the temple, not in Israel, but in Babylon, if all that wasn't strange enough, look what the Lord tells Ezekiel to do in verse 4. Then he said to me, prophesy, over, the, over these bones and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Now, Ezekiel is no stranger to those strange requests from God, is he? He's already done all those strange pieces of street drama. He's ready to do whatever the Lord calls him to do. But this is the first time in the book of Ezekiel that Ezekiel will actually preach to an audience who's already dead. Though the Israelites might have been spiritually dead and far away from God, at least they were walking around, but now he's preaching to dead people. It makes what Francis Assisi did, preaching to the animals, look pretty tame, doesn't it? Ezekiel is, is to preach and prophesy to the bones. And there's a very specific message he's got to give to them, verses 5 and 6. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you and cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. That's an amazing thing to say to some bones, isn't it? The message that Ezekiel is to prophesy to the bones is nothing short of a, me a message of resurrection and recreation. Throughout this whole passage with the breath of God, with everything that goes on, there's a clear allusion to Genesis chapter 2, where the breath of God enters Adam and he becomes a living being. It's going to take that same creation power which was there at the beginning of the world in order to resurrect these dry old skeletons. And Ezekiel, he's ready for anything, isn't he? Verse 7, it says, So I prophesied as I was commanded. In other words, he did exactly as he was told. And because Ezekiel was obedient, because he didn't question God or suggest a different tactic for these bones, because he heard and obeyed the voice of God, Ezekiel will become an instrument of resurrection power through his word and by the Spirit of God. These dead bones will rise again. So you see, in verses 7 and 8, you begin to see the effects of Ezekiel's prophesying. And as I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them. It all sounds positive, doesn't it? It's heading in the right direction. The skeletons are well on their way to becoming real people. Ezekiel's probably stoked with what's going on. But there's a problem. At the end of verse 8, eight we read this. But there was no breath in them. Ezekiel's words have brought them so far. They look the part, but they're not quite there. They're not quite alive. In order for that to happen, the breath of life has to come and enter them. And again, God in his grace, he calls Ezekiel into the work of recreation. He could have just done it himself, but he uses Ezekiel. Verse 9, God tells him what the problem is. He says, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So Ezekiel's got a second job now. He's prophesied to the bones, but now he's been called to call upon the breath of God. And we know that this imagery speaks of God the Holy Spirit, third person of the Trinity, one in glory with the Father and the Son. It was he who came in the Garden of Eden and breathed life into Adam, transforming him into a true, living, breathing 
creature. It is the Spirit of God who brings us into covenant with him. Perhaps you remember in the book of Genesis, we see Abram and Sarai back um, all those years ago. And as God calls them into covenant with himself, they're no longer just Abram and, and Sarai. Now they've become Abraham and Sarah. You can hear the breath now as you say their names because the spirit has changed them. The spirit is indwelling them. And they've been turned from paganism to the worship of the one true God. And it's this same Holy Spirit who Ezekiel is to call upon in our passage. Only he can bring the life which these people so desperately need. So as Ezekiel's words meet with the power of the Spirit, we see the finished product come together. Verse 10. So I prophesied as he commanded me. And the breath came into them and they looked lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. So not only are they breathing, they're humans, they're standing on their own two feet. The best word now to describe them is as an exceedingly great army. They're ready not only just to walk around, they're ready to serve. Well, it's certainly an encouraging vision, isn't it? I'd love to have a vision like that. But what does it all mean? How does this passage encourage us here in Gisborne this morning? Well, thankfully, this isn't one of those places you have to do a heap of work to get to the intended meaning. God himself explains the vision to Ezekiel in verse 11, and he makes known the symbolism of the bones. Verse 11, he says, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel, Behold, there, sir, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost and we are indeed cut off. So these dry, dusty bones, they represent Israel. They have been disobedient to the Lord their God. And as a result, they've come under those covenant curses which God promised in Deuteronomy chapter 28. And many of them have actually literally died, haven't they? And their carcasses have become food for the birds of the air. Others, though spiritually, um, though physically alive, spiritually, they have died to God and his ways. So in Israel's own estimation, they're now cut off from the hope of God's mercy. And you can see how this exile has humbled them. It's had a humbling effect on a once proud and rebellious people. They think it's all over. But this vision given to Ezekiel was given to inspire hope. Though his people are justly punished for their deeds, though they should be permanently cut off from God's presence, God is not finished with his people. In verse 12, Ezekiel is to hold out a message of hope to these broken people. Therefore, it says in verse 12, Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. Though it looks like everything's gone wrong for them, though it looks like the promises of God are buried under a heap of dry bones, here God is meeting with his people in the midst of their rebellion, stepping down into their uncleanness and curse with resurrection power. He's stepping down to get his hands dirty. He himself will open up the graves and raise them from the rot and decay of their spiritual death. He is making known himself again to his people Israel. Though the Bible says that um, Israel had forgotten God dares without number, he has not forgotten them. He's going to teach, teach Israel once again that he is the Lord. You see that again in verse 13. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O oh my people. And this all happens by the Holy Spirit of God. The breath will enter them in resurrection power. We have a look in verse 14. God says, I will put my spirit within you and you shall live and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken and I will do it declares the Lord. So this passage reminds us of an essential truth of the faith. Our God is a God who can be trusted 
to keep his promises. Everything he says will surely come to pass. Just as he was faithful to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David and Solomon, even now God will be faithful to his people even when they have not been faithful to him. Our God is a God who keeps his word. And as we sit here in these New Testament times, this should be even more obvious. We've traced the line, we've traced the promises all the way to when God sends his son, the Lord Jesus. That God stepped down into our death, taking our punishment and rose again victorious over sin, death and hell. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians, all the promises of God find their yes in him. In the cross, we see God's amazing faithfulness to be true to his word. And if he can be faithful in the big things like taking care of our souls, how much more can we trust him to be faithful in the smaller problems we have in this life, in the everyday difficulties of life in a fallen world? He who calls us is faithful. That's what this passage screams to us. We can trust him to bring us safely through this world and into the next. Another thing we learn from this passage is that the Lord disciplines his people to save them from spiritual death. And that's really the lesson of the full exile as well, isn't it? God cares about us too much as, our peop- as his people to leave us in our idolatry and self-destructive ways. And when we do go astray, as we sometimes do, God will use all the tools at his disposal to ensure that we are brought back safely to him. And it may be painful. You may lose heart just as Israel did. You may cry and say, I'm cut off from God's presence. There's no hope for me. But even in the midst of severe and painful discipline, which God sometimes brings into the lives of his children, you can be sure that God is still working out his purposes for your good. The book of Proverbs instructs us how we are to um, conduct ourselves. Should we find ourselves disciplined by the Lord, just as Israel was? Proverbs chapter 3 says this. It says, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. And do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as a son. It's easy to talk about, it's not so easy to do, is it? In the midst of God's fatherly correction, we are quick to lose our hope. When the circumstances of our our life turn difficult, it's easy to think that God's against us. We can easily relate to the words of Hebrews 12, which says, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Our struggle is to believe that at the second half of that verse. However, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. So that's something we can take away from this passage. God disciplines us for for our good, even when it's painful. Another clear thing which jumps out of this passage from us is that God brings resurrection and spiritual life when it looks like there is only death. Israel complained, didn't they? We're cut off, there's no hope for us anymore. And when you looked at their situation, you might have been tempted to agree with them. You might have said, you know what? I think God has truly abandoned you this time. I think we would have thought if we were there that there is no hope for a people such as this. And we don't like to admit it, but we have those categories sometimes in our mind, don't we? We set ourselves up as judge, as though we were God, and we think to ourselves, I could never see this person or that person becoming a Christian, becoming alive to spiritual things. Perhaps some of you here, you've got a child who's currently not walking with the Lord, a parent, a grandparent, a husband, a wife, Perhaps you've been tempted to think in your heart they're just too far gone for God to speak to them. Sure, you might believe God could resurrect a pile of old Israelite bones, but to bring this person to faith, that just seems so radical, so out there. Well, let this passage be an encouragement to you as well. We serve a God who is in the business of resurrection. Resurrection. 
It doesn't matter how old and dry and crusted the bones are. God is able to reach into their death and by his spirit bring about life and vitality. <coughs> if someone's spiritually dead, well, that makes them Jesus' cup of tea, doesn't it? The one who says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who holds the keys of death and hell in his hand. A spiritually dead person and this resurrected saviour, these are two things which go together. The more dead, the more glory God will get when he raises them. Take a quick look around this room and think of the different people here you know to be Christian and ask yourself a question. Are they just a little bit smarter than everyone else in Gisborne? Maybe they were born with a little bit of spiritual inclination. Maybe their parents and grandparents were really nice to them or maybe they were just more educated. All these answers fail to recognize all of our situation before we became Christians. We were, as Ephesians chapter 2 puts it, dead in trespasses and sins. Each one of us was dead. That's a pretty bleak word, isn't it? Dead. You were dead in trespasses and sins. You weren't struggling a little bit. You didn't need a helping hand or a special friend. You were dead. Dead as a doorknob, as Shakespeare said in one of his writings. Just like the dry bones sat in the graveyard, just like Lazarus in his tomb, God himself had to step into your life and resurrect you or you would have remained dead and never have come to him. And if he can do that for us, if he can do it for me, he can do it for you and your loved ones also. He is able to give eyes to see and ears to hear. <coughs> so we mustn't lose hope for anyone. When all we can see is a heap of dried bones, God sees an opportunity to display his grace and the resurrecting power of the gospel. This passage shows us something else, I think, which is crucial uh, for doing the work of the church. It shows us how we can play a role in what God himself is doing in our world. Now, I know it's God who saves people. We know that salvation is of the Lord. We know that we only love him because he first loved us. We know that God is not served by human hands as though he needed anything from us. We rejoice in all these things. But as you read this passage, it is clear that Ezekiel is working together with God to bring about God's purpose in resurrection. Or perhaps to say it more accurately, God is letting Ezekiel join in with what he's doing. There's a syncretistic partnership between God and the prophet Ezekiel. Now God doesn't come and say to Ezekiel, step out of the way, son of man, watch a master get to work. Which of course he could say quite easily. God does not need Ezekiel to do this work. He could have done it himself and he would not have been at fault. But instead God draws Ezekiel into the situation, teaching him and leading him to where God wants him to be. Simply put, God tells Ezekiel what to do, and he does it. He says, prophesy to the bones, and Ezekiel says, so I prophesied as commanded. And there's a profound lesson for all of us there, isn't there? If you would seek to join God in his work of bringing about newness of life, if you would be an instrument in God's hands to bring about redemption, then it must be in the way that God has commanded you to do it. Well, you might say, how am I to know what God wants me to do? Do I have to sit by the river and wait for a vision like Ezekiel did? Or do I need to sit in a dark room praying until I hear God's audible voice? Well, the good news is you don't have to wait for anything like that. God has granted us an instruction book. And this book will leave you equipped for every good work. And that book, of course, is the Bible. God has already told us as his church what he would have us to do. He's already commissioned us to go out into all the world and preach the gospel. It's through these means of grace, through the word and sacrament that God is going to build his kingdom and that newness of life comes to sinners. As we go out faithfully calling people to repent and believe the good news, the, God promises the light of the gospel will shine into men and women's hearts and bring about newness of life. This is God's blueprint for the mission of the church. But it's a hard sell, isn't it? It's a hard sell to tell someone to prophesy to the bones, to speak to dead people with words. 
It's not very flash, is it? Or don't you wish sometimes God had given us a few more abilities like Elijah? We'll call down some fire from heaven in Gisborne. See what they make of that. Then they would believe. But instead we're left with some more humble tools. The word of God, the sacraments, prayer, the ordinary means of grace. And we don't get the luxury of deciding how God is going to serve people. We are to be like Ezekiel, doing exactly as God commands us. Exactly what he would have us to do. So we're to go out and speak the word, just as Ezekiel did. But this passage also gives us further insight as to how we can be effective in this work. Just as Ezekiel's word alone was not enough to bring about the transformation that God required of the bones, so too our words do not possess the power to bring about eternal life. It was only when the breath of God entered the newly fleshed bodies that there stood on their own two feet a mighty army ready for service. So as we go, speaking the words of God as God has commanded us to do, we are to go in dependence upon and in prayer for the Spirit of God to be working in the midst of our efforts. It's not the word by itself, is it? It's the word and the Spirit. This was the error of the Pharisees. Jesus reproved, reproved them saying, you search the scriptures, for you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is there which testify of me. The words of Scripture, however orthodox and true, however passionately put across, if they're not joined with the life-giving power of the Spirit, then those words will remain a dead letter. It is as the breath of God takes those words and impresses them into the heart of a sinner that the blood begins to pump and new life is given. So along with faithfulness to God's Word, which is absolutely essential, we must be those who are in prayer calling upon God to open blind eyes and soften stony hearts. And when we do that, we will see the resurrecting power of the gospel, which overwhelmingly is the point of the passage, isn't it? Our God is a God who resurrects the spiritually dead, whether it's his own people who've gone off the rails or those who are yet strangers to the gospel of grace. God is able to act for his glory and for the good of his people. He will take our words and join them with the life-giving power of the Spirit, and the dead bones will live again, and they will stand as a great army, ready to serve the one true God. So let me just ask you a few questions as we close this morning. Perhaps you're a Christian here today, and you feel like Israel did when they were in exile, you feel like your hope is almost gone and you're almost, almost ready to give up. Well, be encouraged, Christian. Though you may feel ready to give up on God, he's not ready to give up on you. Scripture speaks of Christ and it says, A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. That same God you looked to at the beginning of your Christian walk, he's present in the midst of his people by his spirit this morning. He's ready to breathe life into your dusty corners of your heart. His resurrection power is available for you to lay hold of. Repent and turn to God that your sins may be wiped out and that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Or perhaps this morning you are a Christian, you've become guilty of forgetting the resurrecting power of God. Perhaps you've stopped praying for someone in your family. God is tugging at your heart this morning, calling you to pray again for their salvation. His grace is a grace which reaches into dead hearts. Call upon him this morning. Pray that he might come in power to your loved ones who are yet strangers to the gospel of grace. Or maybe perhaps this morning God has reminded you again of the means by which he brings about this spiritual life. And you'd like to join in with that. You'd like to be a part of what God is doing. Well, if that's you, see the example of Ezekiel. He did as God commanded him. He followed the instruction manual. And that's what you should do too. And maybe on the off chance this morning you're not a Christian. I you're only here because your parents made you come or a friend asked you to be here. 
If that's you, we're really glad that you're here this morning. But hear the word of the Lord. Hear his gospel message to you this morning. God sent his son into the world, the Lord Jesus Christ. He lived the life you should have lived and died the death you should have died. He died on the cross for sinners and rose again from the dead, ascended into heaven and will come again to judge the world in glory. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Trust that his payment on the cross was enough for you and God will grant you everlasting life. He is able to save you from spiritual death by the resurrecting power of his gospel. Amen.